I don't think that Christianity and angst and fear have to be synonymous, but I think a lot of us were raised in a t tradition where they were. I appreciate on some level the deconstruction discussion because it, it's a, attempting to be honest and at least acknowledge what is. And I think that is so important. Well, welcome along to today's video. If you're watching here on YouTube, do make sure to like and subscribe today's video. Got a really interesting conversation for you today. And if you want more from the show, check out our podcast and our newsletter. The links are with today's show. Today, we're talking about deconstructing and reconstructing faith in the Christian music scene with Audrey Assad and Father Chris Foley. Now, there have been a host of stories in the last few years about Christian musicians deconstructing their faith or even deconverting altogether. Uh, the list of so-called exvangelicals includes Michael and Lisa Gunga, uh, Dave Bazin of Pedro the Lion, Kevin Max of DC Talk, John Steingard of Hawk Nelson and others. And today I'm joined by someone with a, with a somewhat similar story, though she'll tell it for herself. Audrey Assad had a critically acclaimed career as a Catholic in the CCM scene ever since her debut album The House You're Building in 2010. However, this year she revealed that she no longer considers herself a practice practicing Christian and she's been exploring alternative forms of spirituality so we're going to hear Audrey's story today. On the other side of today's discussion is Father Chris Foley. Uh, Chris is one of the members of the I don't know, for want of a better word, alt-rock band Luxury, though he can define exactly what their style is. Um, their recent documentary, Parallel Love, tells the story of how the Christian faith of the band members was impacted by a road accident while on tour and why three of the band members, including Chris himself, have gone on to become priests in the Orthodox Church. So uh, in interesting stories on both sides today. And we'll be examining the music of both my guests, why their journeys have gone in these different directions and what we can learn about the process of of deconstruction in the Christian music scene. So Audrey and Father Chris, thank you very much for joining me on the show today. Um, let's let's talk to you first of all, Audrey. Um, it's it's lovely to have you on. Um, and tell us a little bit about your journey, both as a Christian, where, where that started for you, how you got into the Christian music scene, and, and then you can bring us up to speed with, with more recent events. Sure. Um as I usually do, I find myself wondering where exactly to begin because um, the story is so textured. But uh, I was raised in New Jersey. I was grew grown up in the Northeast of the United States and um, part of a, a family of like mixed ethnicity. So my mom is white American. My dad is from Syria, from Damascus and came here as a refugee in the 70s. And um, so a multicultural childhood experience um most of our holidays were you know arabic food we didn't have like turkey dinners for thanksgiving most of the time and um and then my father was it's such an his whole story is worth an interview on its own but he came to the states in the 70s as an 18 year old and in syria had been part of a sponsored child program and because they were very poor he lived in poverty and homelessness in the middle east and um, that person who was sponsoring him took their family under his wing when they came here, which was very helpful because they didn't know any English really. And he set them up with jobs and introduced them to some people among whom was a man who took them to this church, which was a Plymouth Brethren church, which is a, a smaller but global denomination of evangelical um, origin but it split off of the Church of Ireland in the 1800s. John Nelson Darby, some people in your your corner of the world might actually be mm, more familiar mm. with the Plymouth Brethren than most Americans are because it's had a strong foothold in English, um, British And, and it's it's generally seen as quite a, quite a fundamentalist in a sense, yeah. sort of particular Although I will say in England it? and Australia, I think it's gone to a more extreme direction than typically is the case okay. here. But there That's are those tendencies okay. here. And because those... Mm. Because it's an anti-hierarchical um, denomination, they're pretty autonomous from each other, these okay. uh, assemblies, as they're called here. So you could have a very different experience from one to the next, which I'm mm, super mm. aware of because I have friends that grew yeah. up in it that had a very different experience than I did because okay. the, the culture of that particular gathering was different because it doesn't have, mm -hmm. there's no bishops and, you know, there's no pope. It's 
it's a mm. uh, similar to a Quaker type of spirituality yeah. in that way and, um, and in other ways as well. But so that's where I was raised. And so it's a, a small fundamentalist um, cult like upbringing, which I'm now aware, you know, after having done years of work to try to untangle the angst I have felt over religion and spirituality. Um, a lot of it starts with that, with that upbringing. And I remember in particular just being terrified all the time of everything, you know, like, um, of physical affection, let's say. I was so scared of that. I mean, I read my journals. I, <laughs> I have all these journals from when I was in uh, middle school and high school, and I would write things about how you know, holding hands leads to kissing, which leads to, you know what, and you can't ever do that. And it's bad. And I definitely internalized things in yeah, a certain yeah. way. And I'm not going to blame that on the people teaching me. I think it was a mix of what was taught and my particular temperaments. And I also now know that I have been managing OCD my whole life, which I didn't know at the time. And so I was sort of diagnosed with this form of OCD called scrupulosity or religious OCD about five or six years ago. And that oh, yeah. really cast a lot of light and illumination on mm. my relationship to faith because I, I, I don't think it's easy for me to operate independently of that tendency. So organized religion for me always carried a challenge around not being able to um, be terrified of hell and doing the wrong thing, you know, hurting, hurting someone, hurting God. Did your kind of experience of Christianity ever kind of turn into something more grace filled. I mean, I know you you eventually kind of took a journey towards Catholicism. Could you could you definitely? Talk about and that I would say currently, I still have a relationship to Christianity. I mean, I don't think there's a way for me not to do that, and I don't desire to not have a relationship to it, ship to it. Actually, when I and I'll say more about this later, but when I announce that I'm not currently practicing, that that is the material truth of it. I don't mean to say that I hate it or that I could never practice it again mm -hmm. or that I hate Jesus because I honestly don't think any of those things are necessarily the truth. Um, but I am where I am yeah. partially because I need to be here. I, it's sort of, uh, yeah. well, I guess holy because I, I feel that I need to be where I am. And T tell us a little bit about, about the music as well and, and where, you know, you, you really started that, you know, your career as a, a music musician in the Christian sort of music world began, which kind of, as far as I'm aware, it sort of ties in with the point at which you embrace Catholicism. So to some extent. I was 19 when I started writing music and I had been raised in a church where, you know, that wasn't really something I thought about doing because of the rules around my gender and um, the, those rules being, you know, a woman singing in front of the church is a version of preaching, which would be usurping male authority. And so I imagined a life for myself similar to the life my mom had and most of the women in my uh, circles, which was getting married around 18 or 19 years old and having children and staying home and nothing wrong with that. It's a beautiful life. And I wasn't really um, dreaming of other things right necessarily until I had this kind of road to Damascus moment at 19 where, um, and that's a whole story unto itself, but, but my takeaway from that moment was that how I am wired is a good thing. And I, I have gifts to offer and they're a good thing for the world if I put them out there. Um, and so when I began to write songs, I was writing all kinds of songs. It was kind of like Christian songs and love songs. And I was singing at like hiring out for funeral singing, which is a whole interesting place to be. And, um, weddings and Christmas parties and bars. And I just tried everything. I was out there trying to figure out what felt good to me. And I'd written a bunch of songs that I ended up sending to a friend who was a producer in Nashville. And there was a string of events that led to that. But basically I moved up here when I was 24 and I raised some money before Kickstarter. We just put guitar cases out on the end of the stage and raised cash. Like that was what I did to raise money to record this album, which eventually got me a record deal here in town with Sparrow Records, which is part of Capital Music Group now, EMI back then. Um, and it was honestly just, it, I fell into Christian music in a way just because that was the doors, that was the door that opened up to me. Um, there was the connections I had and 
So I started out, I was already Catholic by that time. I became a Catholic in um, 2007. So I was 23 or 24 when that happened. And then right about that time, a year later, I moved up here, signed a Christian record deal. At the time, there were not a lot of Catholics in the music scene. Um, Matt Marr was the only one, other one that I knew then, and um, still one of the only ones that I know that has ha- reached his level of success, you know, as a Catholic, because it is still a strange mm. Mm. relationship that Catholicism and evangelicalism have yes. with each other. Yes. And so yes. that was how I yes, entered into the scene. Yeah. I I mean obviously there's a there's a big back catalog that we could choose from but um why why don't we hear something that's very recent uh which is a cover of the Sade song Pearls. Um let's let's just hear a snippet of of this latest release from you, Audrey and then we'll pick up the conversation again. This is how she's dying. Dying to survive. I don't know what So that's the latest release from Audrey. I'll make sure there's a link to Audrey's website where you can get hold of the song um, from today's show. Um, in a way, you know, a song like that and a lot of Sade's songs actually in general have obviously spiritual themes. And I'm sure the spiritual dimension of your uh, singing and songwriting hasn't gone away, even in this, obviously just because of this present. But but what, what inspired particularly that tweet that, that got a lot of attention uh, earlier in the year when you said, I no longer consider myself a practicing Christian. What would have been the journey up to that point? Well, so in 2016, I was um, diagnosed with PTSD because I was having anxiety and panic attacks with unknown origin. Well, the anxiety attacks had an origin. Panic attacks don't usually. It's sort of like you don't know what the trigger is for those. I had several different um, battles on that front. And I was going to trauma therapy with a Christian therapist, actually, who um, at the time uh, that I was going to see her, I could not even say the word God without triggering an anxiety attack. It was really, really hard. And so I was I had to cancel most of the shows I was doing. I couldn't walk into a church building. I could not um, could not bear to be in mass. It was really, really s- sad because I did not desire for that to be my reality whatsoever. It was just sort of happening. And I realized though, through those things, those notifications that my body was giving me that I had some trauma to process that was spiritual in nature, spiritual and religious abuse are very real things. And at that time I had not really acknowledged or dealt with any of those realities from my upbringing, um, which both included the, my internalization of the doctrines is part of that but also my experiences with human beings who did um, in various ways abuse their relationships to me. I had uh, one kind of long experience of one of the elders in my church being um, sexually and romantically forward with me for years that resulted in a lot of pain and residual issues around spiritual leadership and So that was the beginning of the deconstruction, which again, I really wasn't looking for. It sort of just happened and I found myself in it and it was terrifying, partially because of my fears of hell and my fears of God and my fears of doing the wrong thing. And partially because my whole living had been made, you know, in a world where that connection based on shared belief is very strong. Um, People were listening to me partly because they liked my sound, but in a, in large part also because they believed what I did or shared a lot of that, you know, sure. perspective on the world. So that makes yeah. a lot of sense. And I just was like, I feel so responsible for this and I want to be authentic and truthful, but I don't know where this is going to land. Like I might go through this therapy and then be right back where I was. And so I don't want to say, 
you know, right now that I'm leaving church because I don't, I really didn't know if that would be the case. Yeah. Um, I didn't want that to be the case, to be honest. And, and it's like a, a lot of, I've, I'm hearing my critics in my head right now going, well, why just, why not just go back if you didn't want to leave? And I wish it was that simple and it's such a long story and someday I'll tell it in more detail. But long and short of it is that after a few years of not going to mass because I kept trying to go to mass and having panic attacks, I decided to be truthful about where I am right now. I didn't want people to feel like I was being deceitful um, by just kind of being quiet about it and not admitting what had gone on and what had shifted. Um, and I did go through an angry phase where I had the burn it all down feeling. But again, the, my I'm not really, it's not my style, I think, to come out of the gate with a torch while I'm still processing my own issues. <laughs> and, and, and yeah. And, and and what I get from this story is, is you're as human as anyone else, Audrey, but the unfortunate aspect of it is that often people who are, you know, Christian musicians or musicians in general, you know, with, with a following, they kind of have to often process, you know, their own journey kind of in public. And that, that can be a really difficult thing to do when you've got other people's expectations and following and everything else on, on your shoulders. But we'll, we'll come back to your story in just a moment, Audrey, and thank you for sharing so, so honestly about it today. Um, Father Chris, um, tell us a little bit about your journey then, um, because I think it's probably fair to say that the, the style of music that luxury embodies is, is probably quite different to, to Audrey. But um, tell us about about the band um, and, yeah, to what extent you thought of yourself at all as a Christian band. I don't know that you necessarily wore that as a label, did you? No, we didn't. And the fact that there's a lot of discussion about the band now because of our Christian faith is so foreign to kind of our early days. Cause uh, it's not that we were ashamed of our Christian faith back in the day, but we definitely did not set out to be a Christian band. And if, in some ways, I, I feel like when we first started, we were trying to kind of push up against some of those expectations and um, kind of enjoyed being a little bit, uh, <laughs> I don't know, provocative. <laughs> when we would play Christian shows just to, I don't know, kind of push against that a little bit. Um, I mean, what, you never considered yourself part of the so-called CCM, contemporary Christian oh, music scene in that sense. Oh, not at all. I mean, all, none of us were really interested in any of that or were, we were kind of turned off by, by some of that, I think, just growing up. Um, but, you know, I grew up in a, a pretty strong uh, evangelical home, um, I always kind of differentiate between evangelical and, and mainline Protestant because it was very much, um, you know, we're not Baptists, we're Christian, <laughs> you know, no creed, but Christ. And, uh, um, you know, so I very much a part of that evangelical experiment, you know, kind of in the seventies and the early eighties, um, you know, youth group culture, all of that, you know, I'm sure Audrey, you <laughs> experienced you know, some of that, just, um, you know, a lot of uh, image management going on, a lot of, you know, trying to get the kids all hyped up and excited and, you know, rededicate one's life to Christ 40,000 times. And this time I'm going to mean it, you know, that sort of thing. But, you know, just um, not really a fundamentalist background, just very, like I said, very kind of mainline evangelical. And, mm. you know, so I was, you know, raised with kind of a love for the church, for scripture, for Christ, but I just really felt as I was going into my college years and, and through high school, um, I just could not relate. I, I'd be at these youth group events and I'm looking around and everybody's having this ecstatic experience. And I'm just like, is there something wrong with me? I mean, I'm just, I feel like I'm just being manipulated here. And, you know, I want something, you know, more, you know, sincere and authentic and uh um and then kind of through high school kind of a whole nother story there I, I got very involved in kind of the underground you know punk rock subculture in the atlanta area and you know for me growing up as a christian i found that these were my people <laughs> more than you know the church going uh people because i felt like you know here's this uh underground scene people really wanted to and make a change and they were authentic mm -hmm. and um mm -hmm. 
yeah, so I was really drawn to to that uh, subculture. And then, you know, going off to college, uh, I went to a Protestant Bible college, evangelical college in Northeast Georgia to study missions. Um, not really sure what I was going to do with it, but uh, it was going to be something non-traditional, like going to Amsterdam with YWAM, working with street punks and drug dealers or something, you know, something of that nature. Um, but was in bands all through high school. When I got to college, that's when I met the guys that eventually became part of Luxury. And being in a, it was kind of a culture shock going to this Bible college because it was a little more fundamentalist. And um, so I think Luxury was birthed out of, <laughs> you know, the experience of the pressure cooker of that yeah. world and expectation. Yeah. Let, let, let's because in a way that the music itself is is you know to some extent you know quite countercultural you know alt rock is the way i described it earlier i don't know right. if that's a, a fair label to put on it but why, why don't we hear a little bit um and well this is the the title song of the video documentary that got released recently parallel love Well, as you can tell from that, it's 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 quite a, a heavy sound uh, very often that you guys uh, have. Um, I mean, does does Luxury still kind of tour together? I know that you've had several albums over the years. Are, are, you, are you guys kind of just getting together occasionally these days to do yeah, projects? Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, in a sense, I, we thought we were done probably about 2002 or that's when I went off to seminary. Um, but then we recorded another album while, while I was in seminary. And then the two other guys uh, went off to seminary a few years later. And then 2014 or so, 2013, uh, Lee, our singer, Father David, contacts all of us and says, I'm writing some new songs. Do you guys want to get together? We're like, yeah. <laughs> um, so we, we got together to write and did a Kickstarter. And a lot of our fans were still around. So that we, they supported that. And then our dear friend, Matt, who's been our, a huge fan from the get-go, uh, who's a documentary filmmaker as well, he started bringing a camera to all of these recording sessions. <laughs> and uh, we're like, Matt, what are you doing? He's like, oh, I just think this is a great story. You know, these three guys becoming priests and, you know, all of that. And we're like, ah, who would well, be interested in this other than like three other people? But well he did a several years down the line yeah, it, yeah the, 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 and, we know, have the documentary I'll, I'll, yeah. i will link to it and and let again we haven't got a lot of time just before right. we go to a break but but give us a couple of the i mean some of the significant things in this documentary included there was there was a big kind of road accident that really kind of i think um forced you to think about what you wanted to do essentially with the band um right, describe that right. briefly and and then in the longer term how how you and two other band members <laughs> found your way into the Orthodox Church of all things. Right, yeah, I'll try to do this quickly. Yeah, we are, uh, you know, in about 95, well, 94, we were signed uh, to Tooth & Nail Records, which is, you know, we never really set out to be a Christian band, but here was this label that was ran by Christian people that seemed to maybe be a, a similar mindset. So we signed, and we went to Cornerstone Music Festival, which is like one of the only Christian things that <laughs> uh, we would participate you know we would participate in but it, it was when we were coming back from that festival that uh the van that we are traveling in there were actually two cars we were traveling with another band uh the driver lost control of the van with all the equipment in it and it just turned around and flipped three times people were thrown out um it was an awful accident i was in the car following the van so i was not in the accident but i witnessed it and, you know, three broken necks. Um, our singer was in ICU for a few days. They wasn't, you know, they weren't sure if he was going to make it. Uh, but it was a real turning point for us um, to just start thinking a little more soberly 
and uh, less about, you know, we want to make it, you know, as, as a band, but I mean, we still loved our music, but just things started to take a, a much more serious turn, uh, you know, just reflecting on what life is truly about. And so during this time, we were also starting to get interested in learning more about the Eastern Orthodox Church. Um, and that's kind of a long story there too. But uh, there was a group of us in the town that we were in that were part of a church. And we, as a group, about 35 or 40 of us started studying the history of the church. Um, and the more we read, the more we studied, the more we kept coming back to this Eastern Orthodox uh, theology, practice, worship, and it was just resonating on such a deep level uh, with me that this is, you know, what I've always believed, but never had the words for it. Mm -hmm. um, and so kind of went through kind of like what Audrey was saying, some anger during that stage of feeling like, you know, I wasn't told the whole story. <laughs> and, you know, the Holy Spirit continued to act and breathe within the life of the church for the 1500 years that I was told was outer darkness <laughs> until Martin Luther. And so <laughs> just to the, the mystical tradition of the Eastern Orthodox uh, worship and faith, again, just resonated on such a, a deep level for us um, rather than, you know, the, the rock and roll worship circus and yeah. the, you know, God's doing this new thing that, you know, to fall back into the arms of, of the church and be shaped and formed by that rather than making well, it in our image. So that was going well, on kind of at that yeah. same time. We'll, um, we, we'll come back to your story, Father Chris, because <clears throat> so much of this is fascinating on both, both ends, Audrey and, and yourself, Chris, uh, in as much as, as you're, you're, you know, <clears throat> you, you might expect, you know, young guys interested in rock music to, to want to kind of go to the latest church with the, the drums and the, you know the guitars but you've gone back to something much more ancient in a way um through through the eastern orthodox church but we'll we'll come to all that as we continue to discuss um deconstruction and reconstruction of faith in the christian music scene my guests today are audrey assad and father chris foley we'll be back in a moment hello it's justin briley here one of the things i love about hosting the unbelievable show is getting to ask brilliant thinkers big questions now you'll be able to do the same at premier unbelievable live a new series of live online events it begins on tuesday the 7th of december when i'll be hosting christian thinker and oxford professor john lennox for a q a on science faith and god taking live questions from our online audience it's brought to you in partnership with Caris Productions and Pensmore Films, producers of the award-winning movie Against the Tide on John Lennox's life and ministry. To be part of Unbelievable Live with John Lennox, just register for free at unbelievable.live. Welcome back to today's discussion on Unbelievable. Uh, we're talking about the Christian music scene and hearing the story of Audrey Assad and Father Chris Foley, um, both of whom have had uh, careers in quote unquote Christian music slash Christian bands, though, you know, we can debate whether these are just Christians in a band or whatever. Um, but the uh, the question that, that we've been looking at today, Audrey, is, you know why to some extent there have been so many of these stories of late of people deconstructing and so on yours is not the only one i, I mentioned others such as michael and lisa gunga um uh john steingard kevin max uh, dave dave bazan um so uh you know do, do you what, what, i mean maybe there isn't anything specific behind this maybe it's just that people go on journeys and and we're more aware of you know our stars you know the people we follow through social media and everything else than pe perhaps we ever were but but what do you think there's sort of do, do you notice anything in this particular kind of whole area um of of people going on similar journeys to you in the christian music i scene? do and i mean i know a lot of those people personally we've had many conversations about why and without betraying anyone's confidence i think it's safe to say a similar sentiment or a similar feeling to what father Chris you expressed about we weren't told the whole story um, there comes a point when you were raised in a very insular way which a lot of us were um, to some degree or another sort of uh, taught that th this is the structure of things this is the order of things um, you know in my case even like 
being taught that evolution was an evil philosophy that sought to undermine the creator of the universe and me getting to a point where my, my reason outpaced my need to obey the rules because I started getting too curious. You know, I didn't even know who Martin Luther was. I was so insulated from even that because we were, we were, um, instructed only to read Plymouth Brethren authors. And I remember the moment that it changed because I was uh, in high school and I was in a church library somewhere and I found a Josephus book and I had never heard of Josephus, which is, you know, he was a scribe and writer at the time of Christ around that same era in that same era. And, um, I was reading through this book and thinking like, wait, there's more information. What if this is forbidden, like what else is forbidden? You know, this kind of forbidden fruit, fear-based, uh, way of living can produce a need to go find out what's been hidden because, um, in my opinion, a thinking person, which every person is a thinking person, but, um, a curious, intellectually stimulated, interested person, um, being shown all of a sudden, like, wait, there's a lot more out here. I've never even considered or given the time of day to, and I want to do that. I mean, I think it's natural, you know, I don't think it's an evil mm, thing. I mm. think it makes so much sense that when for most of your life, you've been told for fear-based reasons to stay away from so much. And, um, I remember my brother, and this is the last thing I'll say about this, but like my brother went on a journey like mine years before I did. And at the time he was really into like Dawkins and Hitchens and he was trying to, he was trying to get me to come towards that. And he was sending me things and, you know, I was reading them and mm -hmm. going like, I just don't, I mean, I entertained it, you know, cause I, how could you not at that point? But I remember him saying this thing that really stuck with me and he said, you know, they said that, like it would be backsliding for me to, um, leave behind some of these ideas and that my life would, would be terrible and that my relationships would suffer. And he said, but for me, it's been the opposite for me. I'm flourishing more than I ever have because I'm allowing my mind to explore the things that it wants to explore. And I'm not living from angst and fear all the time. And, um, I don't think that Christianity and angst and fear have to be synonymous, but I think a lot of us were raised in a t tradition where they were, where they were synonymous. And so the exploration mm -hmm. phase feels like necessary. It's like an adolescence in a way that we weren't given mm -hmm. the chance mm -hmm. to have. And so I'm not saying yeah. that's what mine is, but I think there is part, there's definitely a part of me that's being a, a 16 year old now instead of at 16. Cause I just wasn't given the opportunity to do that. Yeah. Yeah. But father Chris, any, any thoughts and I guess appreciation, I suppose, for the kind of journey that Audrey felt she had to go on. Yeah, no, I, I totally resonate with everything that she's saying. I mean, so in this sense, I, you know, I guess I'm an ex-evangelical too, um, because, you know, I feel like, you know, the, the God that I grew up um, fearing was this kind of tyrannical God that was just kind of, you know, shaking his finger and, uh, you know, he had to ultimately kill his son in order to appease his own kind of wrathful, um, I don't know, and, and to kind of start to study the history of the church and understand that, you know, there's a lot of different ways of thinking about God, even within Christianity, and that the little bubble that I grew up in, when that's all you know, you think that's all there is. Um, but to be, you know, like 24, 25 and, and starting to kind of read some of the Greek patristic fathers and how they talked about salvation and God, it was like, for the first time in my life, I felt like, wow, you know, God really loves me. And I don't think I, I never totally knew that <laughs> I was told he did, but there was a whole list of expectations and, and everything. So again to kind of fall back into the arms of just something new you know new for me certainly but to realize this little evangelical culture is a little blip on the screen in the history of of christendom and then to you know all of a sudden start to see that you know, a lot of my evangelicalism was a knee-jerk reaction against rome and all the baggage that comes with that and then to learn that Eastern Orthodoxy, it's like the second largest body in Christendom in the is, world. Is is there an yeah. argument then that a lot of 
these quote unquote ex evangelicals, people who are deconstructing so on, are, are more reacting to a particular Christian subculture and maybe a subculture that they've kind of seen the dirty side of having been in the CCM scene, if you like. Um, yeah, I mean, rather, that... rather than Christianity itself, necessarily. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that's certainly my perspective, but, you know, I'm not, you know, I haven't come to the kind of the same place that, like Audrey has. But, you know, from my experience, I feel like I was on my way out of the church. And if I hadn't uh, e experienced the, the fullness of and the joy of the, the Orthodox faith, I, you know, I don't know where I would be, you know, at this point. So I, I feel like in a way I was on my way towards deconstructing, but my beef was not so much with with God himself, as it was kind of the Christian culture around me. Um, and so, you know, I was angry for a time. I think it's, it's grief, you know, part one of the stages of, of grief is anger. And so I went through that, but I also knew like, I don't want to build my, my spiritual life on, on anger and being reactionary because that's just a shifting sand. So the more I read about kind of Orthodox spirituality and the monastic tradition of, you know, we want to be reactionary in the heart you know the problem is not out here the problem is here and kind of doing this hard inner work like audrey what you described of just having to struggle through you know those toxic you know abusive systems that's I'm, that's part of what salvation i think is ultimately yeah go go ahead audrey i mean i, I was going to say that obviously your 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 journey isn't completely encompassed by by those experiences you had in the, the brethren church obviously in a way you could argue catholicism not a million miles from the, the orthodox tradition no, it's, it, close, it's, it's certainly not, not exactly evangelical same, yeah. but but yeah i mean did did you still not find the kind of the latitude you felt you needed within that tradition did, did you still have just a lot of questions that ultimately led you to, to feeling it you couldn't stay there oh well these are the questions i'm always asking myself i mean currently the way i feel is that when I became a Catholic at 24, it was for most of the reasons you're describing, Father Chris. I mean, and I did look into orthodoxy at the time, but what happened to happen was that I was catechized by Catholics because that was who I met. I met Catholics um, at that time who were very devout and very kind of um, educated in the tradition, which I had grown up around Christmas and Easter, Easter Catholics in New Jersey. I mean, I just didn't really realize there was such an intellectual and um, also mystical um, component because the way I observed it was like, this is a dead shell of a, I just didn't know, you know, until I met some yeah. Catholics who were much more deeply invested in their faith. And so that was who really helped catechize me. And I did find so much relief from becoming Catholic. It was, um, massively different than where I was brought up. And, um, however, there's so much clericalism inside Catholicism that after a few years when the honeymoon period wore off and I started to encounter, um, you know, the clericalism and the different kind of evangelical as well, um, cultural things that have crept into Catholicism, because that's what happens. Things evolve and they, they entangle with the culture. It's kind of the nature of things. I started to realize that I would, I was starting to come to a place where I was like, wow, my objections to Christianity or, or my, um, difficulties with it, let's say more so aren't limited to just evangelicalism. I struggle, uh, still a lot with the kind of gender based ideas that institutional Christianity mainly espouses. And the sexuality discussion is so interesting and difficult, right? Like, LGBTQ issues and LGBTQ people, um, and how that interfaces with what God wants for love and for sexuality. And basically I came to a place where I was like, I no longer currently believe in a God who is a singular person with a singular will and mind. And that is, a, that is the reason I do not practice Christianity is that at this moment, it does not square with my own intellectual understanding of the psyche to imagine that there's a God who has a kind of list of behavioral desires for people, um, around things like sexuality that we've evolved to have. And 
again, I'm open-minded. I read, I mean, I'm sort of, I'm still interested in this, you know, it's not something I've kind of closed the book on and I'm walking away now. It's just, that's where I sit, you know, that's where I am right now. And, um, I am a truth seeker though. That is my nature. It is how I am. I cannot imagine a life where I'm not always trying to refine my understanding of what is true and good and beautiful and those transcendental kind of qualities of the God that was described to me in the Catholic church are still very important. And so, I mean, that's, that's where I am. I don't think it's totally a reaction to mm. evangelicalism. I think I have some, I, I know that I have some other questions and struggles that aren't limited to just that, but a large part of the reason why I started questioning was that evangelical experience. Yeah. Well, any comments on some of those sort of particular issues that, that, that Audrey ultimately felt she couldn't yeah, gosh, stay yeah, in the Catholic I, I Church? Yeah, gosh, yeah. I was thinking, um, thinking a few things. I mean, kind of what drew me to the Eastern Church is that, um, you know, for, for us, the model of our understanding of salvation and our relationship to God um, is not a courtroom, but it's a hospital. Um, and, you know, I think having that mindset, it, it changes a lot of things, or it certainly did for me, you know, that, that Christ is our divine physician and healer. Um, and, you know, if we speak of sin or of missing of, of the mark, it's, you know, we're just ceasing to, you know, kind of live this true authentic life, uh, in Christ. And so salvation is about uh, healing, about change and about transformation rather than being kind of declared righteous and, you know, kind of the substitutionary atonement models and things that are in that legal system. Um, and so this certainly resonated, you know, with me because it, it has room for, for doubt. It has room for you know, we are struggling, you know, through this salvation is, is a process that we go through. And, and on the Sunday after Easter, we have a Sunday called the Sunday of St. Thomas, Thomas Sunday. And even in the hymns, it says we, we praise Thomas's doubt and we sing, oh, most wonderful doubt of Thomas. <laughs> doubt bore certain faith. There is this sense that, you know, is through even Thomas's doubt you know, that we have these, you know, scriptural accounts of, you know, Thomas did, touching Christ's did, side and, and all of that. And I was going to ask Father Chris, I mean, as obviously your your perspective on Christianity has changed as you've, um, you know, gone into the Orthodox Church. A lot of the, the, the deconstructing, if you like, Christian artists and indeed generally artists out there, musicians, I, I tend to find have a fairly a, a more kind of diffuse if you like idea of god um I, I think i was reading just an interview the other day actually with chris martin the lead singer of coldplay and and he actually his parents you know grew up in a church um an evangelical church now um he says well now i don't really have a kind of specific idea of god i, I think of god more as a kind of shared consciousness and but but very few artists i tend to meet are hard and fast materialist atheists of the dawkins variety they, they i don't think um musicians generally like to think that there's there's nothing but you know matter out there if you like there's there's something but they don't like to necessarily put a specific name on it i mean is is that your experience experience chris that uh, of of the musicians that you meet that that there is an openness but but not necessarily oh, a desire to kind of name name exactly what that is yeah and i think that's why i mean i'm a musician and you know it, it, that's why it's kind of my tribe a little bit because what i what i appreciate about artists really uh, of any type there's the sense of you know the journey continues and let's not put an exclamation point too carefully <laughs> um there's definitely an openness to the mystery of God and, you know, the mystery of faith. And um, there's this wonderful quote, Father Alexander Schmemann is, is a well-known theologian in our tradition. And he quotes this uh, French theologian, S Simone Ville, where he says, you know, even though a person might be running uh, in the opposite direction of Christ, if they are running towards what they believe to be true, this truth seeking, they are in fact running straight into the arms of Christ. And I just think that's such a beautiful statement, you know, that the journey continues. And, and, and this is why I appreciate on some level the deconstruction discussion, because it, it's a, attempting to be honest and at least acknowledge what is. And I think that is so important. What, what, um, what, what do you 
how would you say your relationship is now to the person of Christ, Audrey? Um, in, you know, you've spoken a little bit about, about God kind of not being quite such a hard and fast um, being as such, you know, giving commandments and laws and so on. Where, where, where do you put Christ in that? So several years ago, I got very interested in quantum physics. And of course, I'm a lay person. I'm not a physicist. I don't really have a sophisticated understanding of quantum physics, but it's very interesting to me. So I read a lot about it because one of the questions I always lived with um, as a Christian, as a child was like, how am I communicating to God and how am I communicating to Jesus? Like, what does it mean that he's everywhere? What does that mean practically? I don't understand how that's possible. We don't believe in ghosts. You know, we wouldn't call Jesus a ghost. Um, how is it possible for a God and a man to permeate not only space and time, but like all of space and time? The Catholic church sort of spoke of the crucifixion and the mass as a moment outside of time that we could return to and enter into at any moment. But again, I found myself wondering like, what are the quantum physics of that? I don't understand. But interestingly, as I've read about, you know, quantum physics and space time and string theory and all these different things, it's actually made it sound more possible to me and not less that um, God could be real, that God could be um, outside or, uh, or at least not limited by space time, linear timelines. I no longer believe in time as linear. You know, it is right here the way that we experience it. But, you know, f however many thousands of miles out, time operates differently and um, we don't even know the half of that, right? So my, my relationship to prayer and to Jesus is still one of curiosity and interest. I don't really find myself praying to Jesus much, but um, I will always, I think, be curious about Jesus and in a way haunted by Jesus, like as if he were a ghost, because not it's a mosaic of whoever Jesus really is and what I've been taught and what I've experienced in humanity, you know, about who Jesus is. And I'm piecing together a mosaic of him just the way everyone is. And I have no interest in stopping that process. It's not a very specific answer, but I'm, I am like, uh, I'm, I'm forever curious about Jesus and what mm. it means to be in a relationship with a person who died 2000 years ago, but who has impacted the world as much as he has. Um, with at least mm. his alleged life and teachings, right? I believe he existed, but we, all of our filter, all of our uh, knowledge is filtered through experience and humanity and being human beings. And and I, I think there's something really profound about it. And also, you know, I don't stress too much about what Jesus is thinking about me anymore, I, which I hope is good. <laughs> I think it is. Um, <laughs> I love what you said about, is, was it Schmemann quoting Simone yeah, Beale? Yeah, is that what yeah, yeah. Memon was quoting Simone I like, Beale. I like uh, Simone Beale as well quite a bit. But um, I feel that that particular thing you're saying has not changed about me and never will. Um, and that's why I don't lose sleep at night right now. Because I'm like, well, all I know is I'm running toward what I feel is calling me in that kind of deep soul guttural place um, and and embracing those things. And I will continue mm. to do that, you know? And so Jesus has always been part of that in a way. And I probably always will. Um, institutional church and Jesus are related, but they're not the same exact thing, you know? And so mm. wherever my journeys take me, I think I'm still curious. Whereas Father Chris, in a sense, you have found a home in a quote unquote institutional church. I mean, yeah. you are a priest now. <laughs> so, so what, yep. how, how, you know, you obviously have gone on a different kind of journey to, to Audrey here. What, why did the pieces fall where they have for you when it comes to, you know, the, yeah. being able to say, no, this is where I place my faith, my trust. This, this is the, 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 the institution within which I believe we have been given access to uh, God's graces. Yeah, no, it's a great question. I mean, you know, I, it's funny because I, you know, I live here. And so I, I, it, I don't take a step back and think about these questions sometimes, but I would say it has everything to do with the person of, of Christ and um, this whole idea of the incarnation, you know, the fact that God himself in a mystery and however that works itself out, he, 
he took on this flesh he took on matter and now matter matters and now god communicates with us and we participate in him through material things and this is the whole underpinning of of sacramental life and theology and that would be the same i would say probably between the catholic church and the orthodox church but again with the model being you know christ as the divine physician and healer um it just takes on this other element that you know christ came in order to unite humanity with his divinity to restore communion not to just to declare us righteous um you know uh, uh priest friend of mine likes to say that you know god came and the person of christ not to make bad men good but to make dead men live and so this experience of christ as the one who is actively bringing me back to life again to the degree that i want it just like christ when he healed this lame man by the pool he asked him a very important question do you want to be made well um and so it's just every day i need to wake up and answer that question yes i do want to be made well well that might mean picking up my mat and walking christ might be asking me to do the impossible thing that i don't think i can do um and so it's this understanding of, of christ we are participating in his life here and now he came to show us what true humanity really is and this restoration to communion uh, with God, where I tend to want to, I think all of us be, C.S. Lewis speaks of the, the gates of hell being locked from the inside. We can choose to, like, we don't want it, but then Christ bursts into that place in order to hmm. bring his light there and change and transformation. So it makes me a, a better husband, <laughs> a better father, hopefully a better priest. But as a Christian priest, I mean, this is what my life is about now is trying to encourage people and inviting them into this relationship with christ himself do, do you miss anything of that yourself audrey you know as someone who has sort of consciously said no i i can't do that at the moment is is there nevertheless anything about the mass the the sacraments that you that you miss in that way mm, at times yeah i think uh I'm trying to parse out what I'm really missing exactly because a lot of it is my perception of what it did. You know, all of it is, I guess, in a way, my perception of what it mm. was, but that's a thought loop. I often get tripped up. And so I'm going to just skip it and say, <laughs> just simplify it and say what I'm missing. But, um, I think, yes, mm. I, mm. I really mm. love, yeah, yeah. um, and I have to some degree replaced, but not all because it's hard to, it's hard to have the same kind of feeling around a diffuse set of ideas. Um, I do miss a shared understanding mm. of how the universe works and of what, um, like in the Eucharist in particular, the feeling of meeting with God in matter in that specific way. Um, I miss that because for me, it felt, uh, it was very potent for sure. A potent experience, even when I wasn't feeling emotions because of it, it just felt, it felt good to have mm. a weekly moment where in the moment of the mass, mm. where I was sort of there to sort of commune in a more pointed potent way, um, with the God I believed in the God of my understanding, you know, at that time. Um, and there's not really a church for people who aren't, you know, I mean, there are, there's Unitarian Universalist churches and I've gone to some of those and I've visited Episcopal churches and I've tried it, but it's sort of, um, the more diffuse it gets, mm. the less it feels, mm. uh, to me compelling to go to church. It's, yeah. you know what I'm I saying? Suppose, I suppose it's, it's less, it becomes less concrete. The, yeah. the, the more diffuse the incarnational the nature in of sense. Orthodox and Catholic and Catholic tradition was really what drew me into it in the first place. Um, so I don't really have a sacrament now in the same way, although I could definitely make an argument for, and this is another podcast, but my relationship to psychedelic plants having <laughs> definitely taken on some of that same um, power for me, but I, way more rare. I don't do that weekly or monthly right, or anything right. like that. You know, it's sort yeah, of a yeah, yeah. an occasional journey that I take to 
deal with or heal from some particular thing. Um, but that that is the closest thing I can come up with. Yeah, that, but that's 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 so interesting to hear that that if there was anything you could reach for it, it would be it, that was physical that gave you some sense of transcendent communion. Mm-hmm. It, it might it's be a, plant. a psychedelic. Mm-hmm. Um, we, and just interestingly, just a couple of months ago, we did we did an interesting show on psychedelics um, that that I would encourage anyone watching or listening to to, to go and check out uh, on that. But we're going to go to a final break. Um, fascinating conversation. It's always in the last ten minutes it gets the most interesting, <laughs> oh, and we've only right. got ten minutes left. But but we'll 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 come back in just a moment, and we'll 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 sort of start to wrap things up and get uh, and get your thoughts as we continue today's discussion. We're talking about deconstruction in the Christian music scene. My guests are Father Chris Foley and Audrey Assad. In an increasingly secular and sceptical world, it can often feel like faith is under threat. But faith isn't simply blind belief, it's trusting in something we have good evidence for. I believe that in recent years Christianity has undergone a revival of its intellectual tradition and a new generation of believers is emerging, equipped to engage the world with all of their heart, soul and mind for Jesus. My name's Justin Briley and I'd like to introduce you to Confident Christianity, an apologetics course from Unbelievable and Premier that will help you to understand the evidence for God and answer objections to faith. So we've been talking about deconstruction and reconstruction in the Christian music scene. My guests, Audrey Assad and Father Chris Foley. Um, if you want more about the um, the band Luxury and this recent video documentary, uh, which is available now on a number of services, um, parallel-love.com is the place to go. Uh, and I'll make sure there is a link from today's show. I just really enjoyed watching this documentary, Father Chris. Um, it's it's just such an interesting story that gets told very well by by the producer. So um, so well done on, on getting that out. Um, AudreyAsad dot com is the place to go for Audrey's music. Um, you might want to explore her back catalogue wherever you get your music from. Anyway, um, but uh, as we mentioned earlier, the latest release is Pearls. Um, I, I mean, all, all of this sort of you know makes me wonder father chris uh whether there is a way back for someone you know like audrey i don't know what your experience has been of of people you've known who've kind of felt that christianity or the version of christianity that they've sort of grown up in or uh, or so to some extent grown out of um do do you frequent have you seen many people kind of make that journey that I think you sort of went on to some extent of, of reconstructing something, finding that actually <clears throat> there is something solid there ultimately uh, that maybe they missed out first time around. Yeah. Um, I mean, I guess the first thing is, I mean, you know, as a priest, you know, I deal with people pastorally, um, you know, we practice confession and, you know, I meet with people and, you know, people are on, you know, it's, it's a spectrum. There's no, everybody's at this different place. And so, you know, part of what I do is, you know, to try and encourage people, you know, to come back, you know, encourage people to, to come and, you know, come back to that chalice, you know, and no one is, is too far gone for that. And, and I think the main thing is to not have an agenda for people. <laughs> um, there can be this tendency as a, maybe as a pastor to, you know, put people into these boxes and, you know, you need to do this and, you know, then things will finally, but, you know, I think just really meeting people where they're at and listening to their story and, um, I don't know, just kind of be present with folks in that, um, and know that kind of God is bigger than maybe even like the little categories we, we tend to want to put people in. You know, so for I think for me, when I think of my journey, because I feel like I was deconstructing and then before I kind of got to the point of, you know, uh, leaving church altogether, you know, it just I found the Orthodox Church and that really it's a deep well and really answered a lot of questions for me. But um, I think that's the main thing is just really to listen, to not have an have an agenda, though, just as a little aside, like David Bazan is one of my favorite songwriters and i'm a huge page of the lion fan and I've, I've met david a few times um but you know i watched his documentary and the documentary about his story was beautiful and touching and 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 so painful to see that how painful it was for him to get to that point that it wasn't like he was just reacting against something 
But at the end of the movie, I, I kind of have this sense of, man, the journey's not not over. And, um, you know, to encourage him to continue uh, that journey. But I, I felt like a lot of the God he was rejecting is a God that I would also reject. Um, so, you know, I kind of wasn't satisfied with his answer. Well, well, that's that's in a sense why I said earlier, I, in, in the some of the conversations I've had, I had a similar conversation to this with John Steingard, whose story came out a year or two back um, from Hawk Nelson, a similar kind of deconstruction story. But again, you know, and I think he was happy to say this himself, the story's not over and, and it doesn't feel like he's become a thoroughgoing atheist. In fact, as I say, that, that seems quite rare, actually, among most of the music folks I know, whether they're consider themselves Christian or not. Um, but but I suppose the question is, what what if there is a reconstruction does it get back to anything like a, an orthodox Christianity or, or, or are people happy to stay kind of where they are? Now, Audrey, I'm asking questions here that you probably don't have answers to right now. But I, I guess, you know, and again, it's an impossible question to answer. But, you know, could you imagine yourself coming back to something like orthodox Christian faith? What sort of what would have to be in place? Are there questions that would have to be answered? Is, is it is it just the culture you don't think you could, you know, swim in anymore? What what What's your feeling on that? Hmm. Yeah, it's a complicated one. Um, because, as I said, it's like when you start thinking about God from a quantum perspective, you go like, well, God doesn't live anywhere. He lives everywhere. She lives everywhere. They live everywhere. Whatever you want to say about it. Um, I don't think I've left anything behind. I'm just expanding to include more things. And currently, to imagine what feels like a return to an institutional practice where where there's a certain hierarchy to who has access to um, the fullness of the truth, let's say. I'm not saying, I'm not even making a definitive statement about that right now, but that is a struggle where I've, I feel like I, I don't know how I would engage with it exactly. Um, I would happily walk into an Orthodox church right now and go to a service, you know, and, and, and engage with God in that context, but to sort of espouse a whole tradition of faith, um, would be hard. It would be, I think there would be a lot of things that would have to shift in my own thinking for that to work for me. Um, so I'm sure there is a way back to that. I'm not necessarily aiming my bow and arrow at that at the moment. I'm trying to expand outside of boxes right now. And who knows, though? I have definitely heard stories of people doing exactly what I'm doing and returning to some version of the faith of their origin. So who am I in my ego to say that that can't be me? I'm, you know, I can't say that with any certainty at all. I think the journey is not over. I think it never is over. Um, it never is over. I hope yeah. it never is. That's, this is the this is the stuff of life. Is this exploration and this curiosity and the healing of my relationship to the idea of God becoming one of curiosity and exploration and wonder versus uh, fear and angst and terror is a beautiful gift. And I'm like, whatever life holds, if I can preserve this relationship, then I'm open to whatever path holds. And and I think that sense that Audrey do, can't imagine herself climbing back into a box as it were that she feels is now kind of expanded father chris is one that many people share what i mean in a sense what what would your apologetic be at this point for why you don't feel that the church you are now you know part of is necessarily a box uh, that that limits in that sense yeah i i guess i maybe challenge the dichotomy a little bit of you know, it's either this or it's mm -hmm. that, you know, either God is this, you know, fear mongering or, you know, mm -hmm. it's this open season. Um, I would say in a way it's kind of maybe a third option is, um, you know, our true self is our, our life in Christ that he, he is in a sense, like I am father Christopher in Christ. And so, you know, to fall back into the arms of, the church, not as institution, but in terms of this participation in God himself, <laughs> um, physically, spiritually, um, 
you know, it's not a, it's like I said earlier, it's a deep well yeah. and it's, it's a lifetime of, of change and transformation and becoming, you know, more what I was truly created to be. Um, and so it's, it's more, I guess, just an invitation into, you know, maybe not limiting, uh, God, it makes sense that there's a reaction against, you know, kind of where you've come from. I mean, I, I think that that's good. <laughs> Um, but to, in a sense, not throw the baby out with the bathwater, kind of like, you know, evangelicals did with mm-hmm. Catholicism. Yeah, um, but, I hear you. You know, I, I sense that you are still very much, you know, kind of open. Yeah. And, I mean, know, I, I think, think that I am. And I, I agree, actually agree with you. And I feel that I'm sort of, in a way, espousing exactly what you're saying, which is that I don't, I don't think that I've left the stream of of Christ's presence because... I love Hopkins. I think a lot of religious people love Hopkins poetry. And one of my favorites was always the, as Kingfisher's Catch Fire, one of his most famous poems. And, you know, also the Hound of Heaven, which both of these poems, which I think is Francis Schaeffer, is that, I forget the name of the author of that one, but this idea that God is not something or someone who can be outrun or escaped because we bear the very marks of divinity in our own flesh. And, however you want to get to that meaning you can think that's because of the incarnation or you can think that it predated that or that it has nothing to do with that but if that's your feeling if that's your belief as it is mine i don't feel like i have um left god by ceasing to practice institutional christianity at this time nor do i hope i'm not throwing the baby out with the bathwater because i know so many people who are thinking, feeling, free beings who practice Christianity and have beautiful, mystical, amazing relationships to God through it. Um, So I definitely don't desire to do that, you know. We're going to leave it there. Um, It's been a lovely time, a really interesting time. Father Chris and Audrey, uh, thank you so much for being with me on the show today. I will, again, make sure there are links to, to both of you and where people can listen, watch and find out more. But for now, thank you very much for being with me on the show today. Thank you both. Thank you. Thank you, Justin. For more conversations between Christians and skeptics, subscribe to the Unbelievable podcast. And for more updates and bonus content, sign up to the Unbelievable newsletter.